How are you? Great, Bill. How are you? How are you? How are you? Yeah. Lara, nice to meet you, Lara. Let me get a picture of you guys. Okay. Can you get the camera? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Right. Yep. Stand right here. And put your back against this. That's what we'll do. Oh, we're going to do the other side. Oh, okay. So around the other way. Yep, right there. You guys just stand right there. Well, thanks for coming to our meeting. So we do a lot of really fun things here, like try to solve issues in the community. What are some of the? We have a nice little sheet that talks about county government. Well, more than, yeah. This is nice. Yeah. Okay. So we're just going to be attending this meeting. Just oh, look, look over there. Eighteenth working session to order. Can we get a roll call, please? Commissioner Beeman. Commissioner Hodge. 
Present. Commissioner Labar. Here. Commissioner Light. Present. Commissioner Machieski. Present. Commissioner Robbie. Here. Commissioner Sanders. Here. Commissioner Scott. Commissioner Somerville. Here. All right. Do we have a report from the county administrator? No report, but I would like to say welcome to our guests. Thank you for being here. Okay, moving on. Um, I believe we have a report from our Board of Commissioners liaison today. Let them go first. Would you mind telling me who they are? Because I don't even well, know how to recognize okay. them. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. We're going to go a little out of order over here. I'm going to wait Our for Justin to point the camera at us. Okay, there we go. We have friends here from Jack and Jill. Uh, you know, we usually only give one minute for public comment here, but we're not even going to count as public comment. We're just going to give order. the three of them a chance here to talk a little bit about uh, Jack and Jill and the work that they're doing here. And they have really good literature. And this is awesome. nice literature. Welcome. So introduce yourselves and there you go. You're on, you're on TV there. Hi, my name is Isabella. And um, Jack and Jill is a mother's group with kids um, and mothers who um, like there's activities. Um, there's a thing called Debbie Time Ball and um, Snowball. And um, we do a lot of activities for kids and then mothers get together, have meetings about to plan stuff about it. And um, that's it. That's great. I like your hoodie. Else you get a chance in there too. Nice job. You want to hear so much? Not all at once, you have to take turns. Okay, well, then you've been. Go ahead. Just, just say hi. What's your name? Uh, I just my toes. You can bring the mic down. Yeah. Uh, Hi, my name is Layla Bell. Um, what am I playing? Hi, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. That's all right. That's great. That was great. What's your favorite color? Oh man, you got it. Um, is this on? It's on. Oh, hey, it's on. Oh, screen light needs to on. You got to watch out today. Um, hi, I'm Laura. I also don't know what to say. Hey, thanks for being here. Yeah. I skipped half of the discussion. Yeah. You want to share that? <clears throat> no, don't say all of it. It's pretty long. It's a long document. But you've been learning. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go back. So they've been learning a bit about, oh, you see, learn that the podium can go up and down here. We're not going to wait for all that. Uh, they've been learning about what we do here in county government. They have a very nice explainer document that they've been studying up on. So sounds like you're excited to be here. And yeah. Yep, excited. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. Now you can observe uh, good government in action. Yeah, and I went out of order. So um, we're going to move on to public participation now. And thank you for kicking it off for us. Um, at this point, no shot. Nope. Okay. At this point in the meeting, we will take public comment from folks in the audience or online. Um, during working session, we only allow for one minute because this meeting is only an hour and a half. We have um, two items on our agenda today. Um, so if you're here to comment um, on the budget request process, I'm sure you are. Um, that's coming up. Um, and then we also have an update on the winter, winter sheltering um, from the... Um, from Amanda Carlisle and Dan Kelly. So if anybody's here to give public comment, you get one minute right now. If you stay for our regular meeting that starts at seven, you'll get three minutes. Anyone wish to speak right now? Anyone online? Um, yes, Chair, we do have one individual with their hand raised yes, online. Um, that is Jan Wright. Okay. Jan, you are unmuted if you'd like to give public comment. Okay, um, my name is Jan Wright. I live in Pittsfield Township and I wanna make two brief but important points. Um, the first one is that Washtenaw County's housing issues, especially in the Ypsilanti area are very, very important and really need to be addressed. The second one is the climate crisis and the county's excellent climate plan also needs to be addressed. Um, the plan, I think, really needs to be staffed and there needs to be a budget for it. Otherwise, very little can happen on this crucial issue. 
Um, it's, I think it's very important that both of these issues be addressed. I realize that the, the county does not have infinite funds, but it's, they both really need action and funding. And I thank you all for the hard work you do and for the hard choices you make. That's it. Thank you. Do we have anyone else online? No? Okay. Um, we're going to move on now um, to the report from the Board of Commissioners Liaison. This is going to be very exciting for all of us. The much awaited board liaison report. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quickly. I just have a few updates for you all. Uh, first being that um, the October newsletter recently went out for those of you who haven't seen it. So um, this just gave a quick update on the upcoming board meetings. It also gave an updated an update on the fall board commissions and committees that we have available. Um, and those are closing on October 28th, I believe, Bryce. Say that again, October 31st. Thank you for the correction. Uh, we also did it, it updated our, your constituents and your subscribers on the Financial Empowerment Center, as well as the uh, college savings accounts that are available through my future fund. And last but not least, we also shared the, um, the health department's vaccine update, which is also super exciting. Moving on to budget. Um, gonna reshare here. So we have a few budget updates. As you know, you're getting a budget update in the working session, but we do have two budget office hours that are coming up. They're both going to be on Fridays. The first will be this Friday, October 20th. And the second will be uh, Friday, October 27th. If you are interested in attending a budget office hour with Catherine, Tina, um, our administrator and our county deputy county administrator, um, please do sign up here. You have a link. Uh, we, we are trying to ensure a sub quorum. So make sure uh, Commissioner Sanders is so far the only one who has signed up. So if anyone wants to join Commissioner Sanders for some budget office hours, please do so. And last but not least with the budget, um, this is your budget request form. If you would like to make any amendments to our budget, you will need to fill out this form. Um, you can ask questions about this during the budget office hours. You have a link to this, but of course, if you have any questions, you can always feel free to reach out to Catherine and myself. And last but not least, Board Portal, everyone. Who got, who, who's gotten signed into Board Portal today? Commissioner Somerville, Commissioner Ravi, Commissioner Hodge. So I sent around... <laughs> I sign in every day, you know, I love board portal, but I'm, I'm glad to share the love with everybody else now. But I'm excited for this. We're, I know it's very exciting. So uh, Candy, who is on with us virtually, and I worked this morning to ensure that all of you had access to board portal. Um, I sent around some instructions on how to access board portal earlier. That is here. If anyone is interested in doing it now, you can go to meetings.washtenaw.org slash board view. Uh, once you're there, you should, if you are at the office, you should really just have to put in your username and you will be directed to board portal. Isn't that right, Commissioner Robbie? That's absolutely correct. Um, if you are at home or if you are not on the county internet, you will need to do a WC forward slash and then your username and enter your password. Unfortunately, that did not work for Commissioner Macieski, but we're working on it. Uh, Candy's working on it right now as we speak. Um, board portal should look something like this at the bottom. It's a bunch of different cards. If you have any more questions about how to access board portal that you and you cannot access here, just reach out to me. I can help you. And oh, Commissioner Robbie, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to briefly say thank you for helping to figure out this uh, situation. Uh, as the chair of the board um, mentioned at previous meetings, I was told of this magical land that existed virtually where uh, you could easily navigate through the agenda, but I had never experienced this magical land. And now that you have, uh, you know, uh, solved the IT universe uh, for several of us, I think that we're struggling to get on. Um, and I've been able to look through it a little bit. It does look uh, quite a bit easier to digest the agenda. And so thank you uh, to you and Candy for all of your work uh, and to all of the citizens, one in particular that were so concerned about our ability to access the agenda. I am uh, very pleased that we will now be able to uh, review the agenda thoroughly 
uh, with this newfound magical capability. So thank you. Well, that is what we aim to do here. We aim to create magic for you all. So, um, and uh, Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you so much. Of course. All right, we are moving on to discussion items. First up, we have the lovely Catherine, who's going to give us a budget request process overview. And um, you can just take it away. There we go. Okay. Just share my screen really quick. <clears throat> So I'm um, actually, oh, I wish I was, I have to hide this sometimes. Huh? Okay, um, so uh, real brief tonight, we're just gonna go through the budget request process. I'm really excited about the work that we did here to comprehensively look at what the Washtenaw County departments um, were needing um, elected officials are meeting to operate um, what their future looks like, what their ideas were, and to how they would align with the different goals of the organization. Um, so quickly tonight, we're going to just talk a little bit about the process overview, the request summary, and then recommendations, and then the request quartiles, which I'll get into what that means in a minute. Um, so the process we started talking about this long before May, but in May we launched a process for six weeks for departments to put together their budget requests. We created a form that laid out um, how they thought they would make an impact on different items, what their demographics were, et cetera. Um, and we used the budget analyst team to make sure that they, the departments all had support um, for what the things would cost, et cetera. Um, after the department submitted the requests on June 16th, um, we had about a week for finance and admin to look through, review the requests, um, make sure they were a good fit for the budget request process and they were properly categorized. Um, and then we kicked it off to the budget task force who went through and re-reviewed the requests for the impact statements. Um, and at that point we grouped them into quartiles, which is like a ranking to treat them as groups of um, similarly scored requests. And then that all filtered into the administrator recommendations that were developed over the rest of the summer and were presented to you at the last working session. Uh, the scoring metrics, you all have seen this, but just a reminder, um, the potential scores range from minus 15, technically speaking, to 100 points as a possibility. Um, it's not designed to be very at either extreme. We recognize most requests are gonna be somewhere in the middle. Our range was about 22 to 63 ish um, from the places we built this process off of um, that's pretty much in alignment with what we'd expect to see. Uh, the big thing we are looking at is are these requests supporting a mandate or are they are we needing to do this because it's mandated is the county, the sole provider. Um, is there the ability to either generate revenue or find other offsetting savings to fund this request. And then what will the impact be on the climate action plan on equity and then on building safe and healthy communities um, for our citizens. The budget task force was divided into three groups. I just wanted to give everybody credit that participated. We had representation from across the organization, all service areas. Each group represented each service area. Um, we had representatives from elected officials as well as county departments. Um, the groups that participated each scored between 19 and 20 requests. They did not get to score their own departments um, other than admin because we had a representative of admin on each group, but we did divide out which requests were less associated with the individual roles, at least to try to maintain um, some objectivity in those requests and make sure that they're not um, trying to score their stuff higher and other stuff lower. Um, and then we had another, another huh, other members of the budget task force that were project sponsors, um, steering committee members that didn't score requests but were providing overall process support. So overall in the requests, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, sorry about that. 70 requests were submitted. Um, 59 requests ended up being reviewed by the task force. Eight were de um, determined to be either 
net neutral, meaning they had revenues to cover the costs, or minor, meaning operationally they were less than $10,000 a year. Um, and then three requests were determined to not really fit inside of this process and were followed up independently. Um, other requests that were not reviewed, the ones that were followed up independently, um, were not included in budget recommendations, and then the minor and net neutral ones were all recommended. Um, of the ones reviewed, 19 were recommended. Um, 18 requests are pending position review in 2024, um, which is a plan we didn't want to grow our FTE footprint without really looking at our existing positions, our existing vacancy rates. Um, and then 22 requests were currently not recommended um, pending other resources in the future. Um, most of the uh, requests that we received were for program modifications. Um, a few new program ideas, those are things that we haven't done that we think would be good to start doing. Um, and then one-time funding requests, there were nine of those. Um, by service area, largely the largest group of requests were from the support services area. Um, and you can sort of see this here, that light blue is all the support services requests. The other ones are grouped, dark blue is public safety and justice, orange health and human services, and then green civic infrastructure, and then the red is land use and environment. Um, so when we look at how the requests broke down across them, so 43, thank you, sorry. 43 new, new FTEs were requested. This is one of the reasons why we wanted to put all of those new, as many of those new requests on hold pending that, that vacancy review and that position review, because there were so many identified new positions, we didn't want to grow our footprint that much. Um, on the structural versus non-structural, there's about $12.3 million of structural requests and $5 million of non-structural. Um, and again, we can see they were heavily dollar weighted toward the support services, especially the non-structural requests. Um, but there was a large chunk for both public safety and justice and health and human services service areas in the process. Um, so we took this idea from other places that have done um, program-based and priority-based budgeting um, and to try to digest instead of just looking at everything in rankings and where it makes sense, they broke it out into quartiles. So it's sort of like percentiles. If you think back to your ACT and SAT days, so if you're in the first quartile, you're in the top 25% of, of requests, fourth quartile is the bottom 25%. Um, and so it's just a chance to kind of group them and treat them with that. Again, higher quartiles were not designed to guarantee funding um, or funding recommendations, but more so to say that these requests based on our priorities are more in alignment with making an impact on those priorities. Um, so overall, Requests by score, uh, on average, the by request type, the one-time requests scored higher at 47.3. Um, a number of those requests were aimed at climate action, so they got a lot of points from that part. Um, new program requests were at 44.3, and then program modifications were at 40.3. Um, when we look by service area, we do think, uh, we do see that largely the average by service area is pretty similar. Um, I was curious how that would play out because Oftentimes we think of certain service areas being more in alignment with some of those priority areas, but there is a lot that, um, especially like support services is trying to do to support those um, priorities as well. Um, and then looking through the quartiles, again, the first one, the average score was 54.1, second 46.6, goes down to fourth quartile where the average score was about 29. Um, so again, that's the range we expect to see. So it shows the process was working like we intended. Um, from a financial summary, um, again, the program modifications is the largest area at 8.77 million in requests. Um, One-time requests were about 4.23 net um, and then 4.4 million for the new program areas. The total cost by service area, again, so, so, uh, support services are looking for $8.6 million. Um, and then it goes down to health and human services for 4 million. Um, down to civic infrastructure for um, half a million. And then the interesting thing was by quartile, the programs that fell into the first quartile were largely much more expensive than the other ones. Um, again, just an interesting fact uh, or point of alignment that there are things we wanna do, but also a lot of the stuff that aligns with that is 
more expensive, it's not necessarily the cheap and easy things that we want to quickly implement. Um, this, you all have seen, these are the same recommendations as last week. So I just wanted to provide them for context in case we needed them um, for discussion later. Um, these are only the requests that came out of the request process. So there were additional ones for board priorities, um, for wages that aren't listed here because they're not associated with the request process. So just, again, the list of the structural recommendations, um, non-structural general fund as a reminder, are funded primarily by that increased cost allocation plan revenue at rates we've never seen before. Um, so we really wanted to be very cautious with where we directed those um, resources. If that revenue does turn out to be, or not revenue, if that cost expense credit does turn out to be the new reality, then these would be good ideas for structural funding. Um, and we will bring that back um, in future budgets when we know. And then a list of infrastructure requests as well. The infrastructure requests are heavily weighted toward 2024 because they were primarily non-structural requests. Um, and then lastly, ARPA recommendations, again, also non-structural requests. Um, they are also included at tonight's um, board meeting and the packet in a memo form. So we can start operationalizing those internal government services awards, but this is that list. Uh, so overall, when we look by recommendations, um, we see that the amounts going and being funded by non-structural ARPA and non-structural general fund are about the same around 50 point on average. Our structural recommendations are lower than the ones that we did not recommend funding. And this is largely because what we what was recommended to be funded structurally was focused on items that were either maintaining existing service levels, trying to contain future costs, um, or dealing with long-term budget issues. So um, a lot of those non-structural general fund dollars are ones that can hopefully convert to structural requests in the future but we were being very conservative with what was recommended um, in a structural fashion. Um, the other thing is we can see by overall, the yeses um, were scoring higher than the noes. That's also a thing we wanted to make sure we um, saw. The average score for things that weren't recommended was 35.8 and the average for requests that were recommended was 45. Um, and then the other thing when we look by quartile, um, we see that the grouping of, the, um, of requests that are included for recommendation are more weighted toward the first quartile. Um, only two are recommended that are in the fourth quartile. Um, and again, that comes back to there are oftentimes things that we uh, need to do that not necessarily going to move the needle on um, our priority areas, but we are focusing resources toward that first quartile. Um, the next four slides, again, I'm not going to go through this presentation because I don't think you want me to read out scores for 59 requests, um, but it is a visual presentation of where the scores were coming from. Um, the level of mandate is the green bars, provider points, orange, red is cost recovery, and then impact on climate is dark blue, impact on equity is light blue, and then the green is impact on safe and healthy communities. You can see a lot of the requests, especially in the first quartile, are making an impact in lots of areas, which is another thing that we expected to see. Um, there's more detail. I know um, you also got an email report. Every request that um, was scored by the task force and the minor net neutral ones are included in that report with all the details in case you have any questions. Um, but I'm here to answer any if you have them as well. Um, and yeah, so with that, uh, next steps then, this is the other piece that's really exciting about this process is that it's not designed to be a thing that ends. Um, so if there is new funding available, structural funding that becomes available, we can keep this inventory active as a place to start from um, if we have the ability to fund different things um, or fund some of these programs into the future. Um, new positions also are largely recommended to be on hold pending this position of vacancy review next year. And it can be hard work to do that. I think having an idea of what kinds of positions we really are needed will make that work a little more um, worthwhile instead of trying to aim in the dark at something we're not sure where we're going. Um, and then lastly, we're looking to build upon this to score all county programs that's coming next year and not just budget requests to be able to look countywide 
which programs are moving the needle. So this was meant to be sort of a pilot project of that approach to um, do a proof of concept before trying to tackle um, all county programs. And then uh, in two years, we plan to run another budget request process, um, trying not to wait four years to do this because we recognize organizational needs will change much faster than the quadrennial budget um, might make available. So with that, um, I'm open for any questions you will have on the process. Commissioner Labar. Thanks, Chair. Um, just very quickly, I, I don't necessarily have any questions, but just a little bit of feedback. Um, one, there's been a tremendous amount of work done by staff, and I appreciate that. This is a, um, not just a much smoother uh, mechanical process, but certainly the smoothest I've ever seen. Um, the one nuance that is hard with submission um, comes from essentially being able to articulate those things which we don't know uh, in terms of other components of the budget mm -hmm. and the understandable ask in terms of information as it relates to equity, to climate impact, to, to safety generally. The, the, from the commissioner standpoint, some of those things are to be determined they depend on, uh, you know, interpretation and, and, and opinion and so forth. Um, that was really the only uh, in, in sort of area where I would hope for um, not even change, but just that I flag. I really appreciated the way you had the ranking system in terms of where we were looking to, to take it from. Um, and it's, it's just been well professionalized. So um, you know, the, those those nuances I just mentioned aside, I, I really appreciate the amount of work that's gone into this. Um, and yeah, so so that's my feedback. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, as a quick response to that, that's one of the reasons why we use the task force to review because there's a departmental perspective, but having a collective organizational perspective of what those impacts would be, the departments did their best to, in words, explain what it was. And then whether that felt extreme, strong, moderate, neutral, we had more eyes looking on so that we had a more balanced approach to like keep them across. Is that kind of where you're? Yeah, and I wanna be fair too. We are the outliers within the organization in that we are not internally developed and operating and we are not uh, responding from within the organization proper, but rather in uh, you know a, sort of a, a pivot point in the community between the community as a whole and the organization and, and so forth. So to some degree, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are, again not complaints, but I'm yeah. I'm saying this aloud. I don't have I don't have much of a fix necessarily. I just wanted to articulate it. Fair enough. So, but but thank you. It's it's really intentional and good work, and I appreciate it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next question, um, or next commissioner, um, Ravi. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation and for all your work on this. <clears throat> I have a few questions on uh, on the presentation itself. So, and maybe I missed you saying this, but uh, the recommendations uh, table that you have in the slideshow, mm -hmm. um, those, I have questions about the recommendations themselves, but also, whether this is not, is this a complete list of recommendations or are we gonna be adding things? This is not the complete list that you all saw on October 4th, which I know you couldn't be here, but um, this is just the request that ran through the budget request process. So there were additional recommendations for um, board priority allocations for housing and homelessness and for the East Side Rec Center, as well as um, a set aside for um, wages for all county employees. There wasn't a departmental request mm -hmm. for that kind of thing. Um, and then I'm um, trying to build up the risk fund balance for future claims that were so, coming. So, so those will there be other items here. added as recommendations through this process or is this, your, is this the final recommendation to the board is just the items in the chart here plus the things? Yeah, the I would say if you're looking for the final recommendations to the board, the presentation I gave at the last meeting is the comprehensive list. This was just designed to show that the majority of those recommendations came out of this budget request process. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is like looking um, down on, pay, on the 22nd slide, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess page, well, I guess it's, I don't know if it's page 11 or 22, but uh, where it says the first quartile, um, there's several items on there where you say yes, mm-hmm. partial and pending. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess maybe you explain this and I just missed it, oh, but what does pending yeah. mean? No, but I glazed over that. You're right. Okay. So. Um, so yeah, on each of the quartiles, there is a, it's grouped by first what the re- budget recommendation was. So yes, are anything that was either non-structural ARPA, non-structural general fund, or structural dollars are full yeses. Partials are ones that are included in the recommendation, but what was requested is not what was fully funded. So on the first quartile, Washington Health Plan requested 400-ish thousand. I was recommended to do 250,000. So we wanted to not say that it was a yes in here, but it was a partial request. And then the resiliency office had asked for the three positions um, and it's one funded for one year pending that position review. So we treated those as partial requests and just in the interest of transparency. Um, and then pending, anything that's impending are four new FTEs. Um, and, the, and then the no's are just ones that we didn't have identified funding. So in first quartile, the like healthy together one, was the ninth scoring request, but also requested over a million dollars. And we didn't have the million dollars available um, in any sort of structural fashion so to direct I, that way. Can you explain pending again? I, I just don't understand what that yeah. means. Um, so pending goes back to those 43 new FTEs that were requested. Um, Administrator Dill was concerned about trying to continue to add to our FT footprint when we know we have unprecedented vacancies. We've been talking for a while about needing to really look at the positions that we have had authorized. So rather than saying yes to some of these, it was let's incorporate that all into one process. So we have their requests. It's not a yes, it's not a no. We just need to look at the other side of the picture before a recommendation can be made. And that's what's planned for next year. The other side of the picture being? To not increase our FT from 1400 to 1450, but to instead see if there are ways to outfit. I don't know. You want to explain that? <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it quite right. Sure. So, so my thinking around this was to make certain that we didn't, as you heard Catherine uh, mention, add additional FT, FTEs at a time when we had uh, unprecedented vacancies in our organization. So currently we budget for a number of vacant positions. Some of those positions have been vacant for a while now and I wanted to make sure that there is some kind of uh, reconciliation that we do before a final recommendation as to not add positions without understanding what, what the current impact is of, of those vacancies that we have. So what I'm reading, what I'm hearing you say is basically, and I know some of the offices and departments that you're speaking of, in particular where there's a heavy amount of hold vacant positions that exist. And so you are planning to look at the budget holistically and those hold vacant positions and potentially transitioning those hold vacant positions to fill this need in the final budget recommendation, even though it's not necessarily, a, it's a financial like net zero change to the organization as a whole, but from department to department, it may shift. Is that, that, is, the goal? that is the optimal goal. Uh, obviously, uh, net zero has a lot, a lot of uh, factors associated with it. But yeah, to your, to your, your response, absolutely, that would be the, the the best scenario. So, when will we know if these are requests that we can grant or not, based on that? So they're not recommended in the 24 through 27 budget. It would be coming as part of this position review that is going to be done next year. So I'm not sure that type of would be recommending it in the react. I don't think we've gotten that far on when we'd be making those recommendations. So none of the recommendations involve staff hiring. None of the what? None of your recommendations through this budget process involve adding FTEs to the organization. There are two recommendations that involve adding FTEs. The one is the assistant prosecuting attorney for the, um, and that's to continue delivering the services of the economic justice unit. And the other is an additional assistant court counsel focused on labor relations, um, which is aimed at, we currently spend over $200,000 a year in outside counsel costs. Um, and so trying to bring that expertise in-house and reduce or control costs into the future. But I have further questions, but if other people want to ask. Well, I was actually, I was gonna 
intercept and just ask if we if everybody's comfortable moving on so that we can get to the sheltering update because I want to make sure we have enough time for that. Can I can I just like throw out a bunch of questions that they can answer later? Sure. You okay. Go ahead. So like I guess I'm wondering like the resiliency officer, that's an FTE, the MSU educator, potentially. That's right? an MSU staff person. It's not a county FTE, it's just additional services. Okay. And then I mean I guess like I, I guess overall, like, but I'm a little bit disappointed that we, it seems like, have discounted va valuable potential projects just because it involves hiring somebody. And for example, the Washtenaw County ID program is really important. I know that the clerk's office needs somebody to help quarterback that, but, and they scored really high in the scoring, but you've put them in the pending category just because it involves hiring somebody. And I'm a little concerned about that. So I will voice that concern and end my comments in the interest of the chair's blood pressure and time. Oh, my blood pressure is <laughs> not high. Um, I just really want to get this winter sheltering update. Okay. Yes, please. So, chair, just to re respond to Commissioner Robbie. So we we certainly plan to move with deliberate haste, and and I would say before the end of the first quarter of 2024, we plan to br bring back to you a recommendation around uh, those vacancies. Again, not to, to compromise the current service delivery model or, or a framework for our organization, but to look at those, those vacancies with an eye on where we might shift resources uh, to provide some kind of balance for, for the organization. So there will be more to come and we'll, we'll try to do this as quickly as we can. Thank you. All righty. Oh, the last one, Ashley already covered. So, yeah, well, awesome. Thank so, you so much, I Catherine. Will. We appreciate you. And I saw that Ashley has already emailed us the information to sign up. So that way, Caroline's not taking all the time. We don't want to give her too much time. Uh, um, yeah. And cool. then just if you have any questions in the detail, that report's really long, but each of the requests is one to three, four pages of everything the departments were saying. So, if you have some questions around it, um, that's also a great resource um, for you all. So. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. All righty, next up, we have the COC Winter Shelter Task Force update. Um, and we've got Amanda Carlisle from Washington Housing Alliance. And we have Dan Kelly, the executive director from the Shelter Association of Washtenaw County. Hello, friends. Hi, thank you all for having us tonight. And we can share a little bit about the task force that's been working over the summer to um, come up with a plan that is sustainable for um, winter shelter. So I'm Amanda Carlisle. This is Dan. Um, I'm from the Housing Alliance and Dan's from the um, Shelter Association. Go to the next slide or two. Um, so the, um, the Continuum of Care Winter Shelter Task Force was created by the Continuum of Care Board in April. And the goal was to help analyze existing data and programs for winter shelter, research best practices for providing um, shelter, and develop strategies and recommendations, as well as identifying funding necessary to provide shelter for all populations this coming winter. Um, meetings were held between May and October, uh, and we will be continuing to meet um, as our work is not finished yet. The task force members or participants included um, from a lot of different organizations and included uh, shelter providers, um, other homeless service providers, as well as folks from um, government partners and um, folks with lived experience of homelessness. So uh, just to like um, let you all know how kind of this task force came about, actually in 2013 and 2014, we experienced in Washtenaw County and across the Midwest polar vortex, um, which uh, was um, deep cold um, climate and lots of snow. And that led to a lot of changes in winter programming that following year and a task force similar to the one that we have this year was formed in uh, 2014 and met for about two years. Uh, some of the recommendations out of that are things that we might know and kind of take, a, take for granted now, but um, weren't in place in the polar vortex year. So um, there was the addition of daytime shelter, 
um, at the Delana Center, as well as additional sites. Um, there was the addition of an offsite overnight warming center um, offsite from the Delana Center, and then additional, um, a small amount of money, money that went um, to help individuals that couldn't stay in congregate settings um, stay in emergency hotel and motel stays that year. So that's kind of how we've operated um, until last year. So in 2022, 23, um, the winter response kind of transformed again due to a need that we were seeing. So last winter, um, the Shelter Association had their year round shelter beds at the Delana Center. They also did offsite warming center in Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti later on in the year. Um, there was expansion of daytime shelter sites during the weekdays. Uh, Ypsilanti Freight House was added as a site that year. Um, and the Shelter Association um, operated uh, the Delana Center on weekends, um, along with Cal Calvary Baptist Church, um, and then various congregations in Ann Arbor did a daytime shelter as well. There was also, as you all know, funding for hotel motel stays for families um, through OCED and in partnership with Mission, and then funding for stipends for families through OCED as well. So a little bit of the data, which I think you probably have seen, but this is, um, go ahead one more slide, from se September 2022 to September 2023. Um, this data shows kind of, we started to see a real increase or jump in the number of families um, with children that were experiencing homelessness between January and February, and that has sort of continued to rise, and we are sort of feeling like we're at a new normal um, with uh, additional families that are experiencing homelessness, and um, you'll see the other populations. This is all data from our communities by name list uh, um, process where we have veterans list, a list for um, single adults, and then a list for families, and this is the kind of all of the data in one. And then um, the families, as you all know, um, kind of skyrocketed between January and February. Um, this was at a time when we, um, the housing access for Washtenaw County, the Hawk system um, was still in transition and family assessments um, were taking a really long time between four and six weeks to, for families to get assessed. And so during that time, hotel, uh, hoteling was used um, to help folks, families that were reporting being um, literally homeless. Um, I'm proud to say that I think you all had heard um, at a previous meeting, but we are now in the 48 hour range for family assessments and so um, SOS um, has been doing a great job of um, getting those assessments in a timely manner now, but that was kind of the reality that was this last winter. Next slide. And then this is just a single adult households winter shelter census from the Shelter Association between 2019 and 2023. The yellow bar shows what we were seeing in 2023 and our um, data showed that on um, a night in January, it had the highest um, census at 174 individuals that were being served that night. So that was kind of the max that was seen um, in terms of individuals needing shelter. And then lessons learned, uh, our task force talked a lot about this, um, what we had kind of learned from 2023 or 2022 to plan for 2023 winter. Um, and I would say we have seen an increased acuity of need for single adults, especially. So increased mental health and substance use challenges over last winter. Um, the Shelter Association has also seen a real rise in the number of single adults that are older adults, ages 51 plus. Um, and that was 36% of the population served last year in winter shelter programming, and then 66% of single adults reported having a disability. So really acute needs um, for individuals over the winter months. We also learned that shelter diversion stipends that were used were less costly than hotel stays. So 58% of the households that had received a diversion stipend, um, which averaged about $800 over the course of a couple of months, 58% um, of those households never returned to the homeless system of care as of the end of September of this year. Um, and the lack of kind of what I talked about before. Amanda. Can I can I ask a question just so everybody sure. knows what you mean? 
by um, diversion stipends. Can you like give an example? Sure. Yeah. So um, families were offered uh, about four hundred dollars a month um, for average two months, and that was um, to be used for them to not have to e enter into emergency shelter. They could use it for things like. Um, you know, staying with family and friends and supporting the household and buying groceries or, you know, transportation to a different place um, where they had more stable housing. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities, but it's, it's basically a, like a, a small basic income um, that's offered to families to keep them um, housed elsewhere. Thank you. Um, and then like I said, we kind of saw that surge in hotel use among families um, and learned that the lack of, well, we kind of knew, but learned um, well that the lack of case management to hotel families led to longer stays for folks. Um, lastly, the there were reports from our um, programs that increased staffing needs were really um, uh, apparent as of last winter, both um, daytime, you know, winter shelter, overnight shelter, um, and weekends, and that sort of relates to the first bullet at the top, the increased acuity of um, needs that folks have. So I will turn it over again. You want to? So uh, we spent a lot of time talking to other communities as well across the state. Uh, partners uh, in Kent County, Detroit, uh, Oakland, and out Wayne County, because Wayne County separates their COC into Detroit and then the rest of Wayne County. And actually, just this week, we talked with Traverse City as well, which isn't on this list. But um, And uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of communities uh, are experiencing the same issue. They're experiencing increases in capacity, that same increase in acuity need. Um, and if you look across the state, it's pretty much a shared issue. In fact, uh, with the conversation with Traverse City this week, they shared with me, which is quite shocking. They have a 90 person encampment right outside the city. And they're talking about how can we ramp up our winter shelter services and increase capacity exponentially this winter and kind of figuring out how we can do that together as a, as a community. And that tracks, unfortunately, with nationwide reports. Um, if you've seen recently, there was some stuff uh, nationally, the housing and urban development shared their homeless uh, information and their numbers. And there was a 14% increase nationally in the last year that was widely reported a, a couple of weeks ago. So we're seeing a lot of issues um, across the state with uh, this increased need and its acuity and it's also um, numbers of people that are on the streets. Uh, next slide. So, uh, so yeah, so obviously we've done a lot of planning with the task force around how we plan to respond this winter. We're always trying to strengthen that, that plan, but this is the current plan that we have at this moment. Next slide. So uh, currently, if you look at the individuals and uh, we wanna increase our bed capacity, because as you saw with that, that graph that had a lot of things going on from the last couple of years, uh, last year was the yellow was standing out the most because that was the, the most numbers we've had in terms of number of people that needed an overnight bed that was 174. That was a 19% overall increase from the previous winter. If we see something like that again, we think we would need up to 200 uh, beds on a given night to be able to maintain that commitment that we've always had in our community that, I mean, it's something I'm really proud of in Washtenaw County. When I came here from working in other communities, we had this commitment on the individual's end to never turn anybody away and to have adequate beds, at least in the winter months. I mean, the rest of the year is a whole different story. We don't have nearly enough beds, but in the winter months, without increasing to 200 beds, we're in danger of not maintaining that commitment that we have as a community. So um, with that said, you'll see there's a, that's a breakdown of the individual sheltering primarily done by the Shelter Association, aka the Delana Center. Um, we increase capacity at Delanas. We turn every single space in Delana Center into a winter shelter space. Our cafeteria uh, becomes winter sheltering. Our second floor service center becomes additional winter sheltering. And then we have, uh, happy that we have uh, many uh, amazing congregational partners that team up and do a rotating shelter uh, for one week, about one week at a time through the whole winter. That allows us to serve 25 additional individuals. Uh, and then as Amanda mentioned last year, we piloted uh, with partnership with the city of Ypsilanti, um, uh, a pilot program around additional overnight capacity in Ypsilanti. We're planning to have that again. Um, and in fact, our current need right now is we're looking for a site Friday through Sunday. We have a congregation that's willing to support Monday through Thursday, but we need Friday through Sunday still. And we're looking in earnest, we're meeting with every congregational partner that we can, working with all the different, uh, the, the city and all, every, every partner we can to try to identify a site. So a little plug there, if anybody is on this and aware of a site in Ypsilanti, please reach out to me. Um, 
And, uh, and, and, and I think along those lines, one thing to think about is uh, our, with those increases, our current uh, funding needs and gaps are there are, what we're planning to do at the Shelter Association is do a significant private fundraising just to meet that current um, need right there. Assuming we have stable funding from our uh, county partners, city uh, of Ann Arbor and city of Ypsilanti that we did last year, the Shelter Association would need to raise about $200,000, which we're planning to do. So we've got to ask out that we're putting together for our amazing donors and stakeholders in this community to, to raise those funds. Um, but that's an important gap that we have. Um, but we want to reach this 200 beds minimum. So next slide. Uh, on the family's end, uh, as you can see, we've got about, we can serve about 17 to 19 families across three main providers, SLS Community Services, Alpha House, uh, and the Mission uh, Motel program that uh, helps those with the highest need, uh, those families in need. And that allows it for about 72 to 80, 78 to 82 beds on a given night. And SOS has committed to increasing their seasonal capacity and adding two more families. We know that's not going to fully meet the needs. So that's why we're tr trying to add these other programs that Amanda talked about, more diversion efforts um, and uh, eviction prevention and uh, additional motelling. Uh, next slide. So really some important considerations on the family end, as I mentioned, we've got this need for increased eviction prevention resources. There's currently no funds to prevent evictions uh, in the county. So we really need to do that so that we see less families finding their way into homelessness. And we also, as Amanda talked about earlier, that diversion uh, is a really uh, powerful tool. We've done it at the Shelter Association as well on the individual's end. It's shown to be especially effective with families and we estimate we can divert 30% of families with additional diversion uh, stipends and diversion resources. And like Amanda said, that could be as simple as, um, I'm sure we all wanna be in a world where we have enough affordable housing for everybody, but until then we have to get creative. And, I, and what that diversion means is, is somebody may be able to stay with a family member, but maybe they have to figure out their food situation and, and that initial diversion allows them to do that. And they're in a safe place and don't need emergency shelter in that case. Um, and then we also are, talking about planning a, uh, or trying to plan an overnight rotating shelter. We still have to find uh, funding and sites for this, um, but the plan is in the coldest months of the year to be able to launch uh, additional rotating shelter for families. So we ensure that we've got that same commitment we make to individuals that we can make to families. Uh, and then there are also, as I mentioned, there's a need for short-term hotel stays for those that have the medical complexity and behavioral health needs, the highest needs uh, of our families. Uh, next slide. So uh, with that said, there's also specialty populations uh, and other populations uh, like Safe House, uh, which serves those uh, survivors of domestic violence across the community. As you can see, they serve 12 to 18 families or individuals uh, in need at a given time. Ozone House has a number of programs and they're launching in December or January additional emergency sheltering for uh, young adults, generally 18 to 24 year old range or 10 to 17, excuse me, yep, I mixed it up. Yep. And then they also have some for 18 to 22 and uh, some transitional living facilities. Um, and then there's Michigan Ability Partners operating uh, temporary housing. That's been like for veterans, I believe. And then uh, it's Staples Veteran Hope House as well. So uh, ne next slide. Uh, and then when we talk about day shelter, we wanna be able to offer day shelter. Ideally, we would love to have two day shelter sites uh, and, and in Ann Arbor and also in the Ypsilanti area, seven days a week. Our current plan right now is to have that available Monday through Thursday, um, two sites. And then the remainder of the week, there would be one site that's primarily operated out of Ann Arbor. Long-term, we really wanna try to launch seven days in both sites because there's a need for, for more day sheltering across the community, but that's our current plan. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so other than the city of Ypsilanti and the city of Ann Arbor, like no other local government partners have engaged in these conversations? Not yet. Interesting, thank you so much. No, but thank you to Ipsy. By the way, I just went to city council yesterday and they've, they're they continuing to support these efforts. So just wanted to plug that in there. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we are planning to, to offer two sites four days a week. Pardon me, um, Commissioner Sanders would like to ask a question. Part of it is follow up to um, Commissioner Somerville. Um, how many other um, entities have you approached? How many have you approached? When was the last time you approached them? 
And what did they say? And then uh, my other question is, I wanted you to share with us um, what what is an example of an of eviction prevention? So I I won't say I had the pleasure. I had an experience to sit in on. Um, I guess you'll call it eviction court. And so some of those issues are, you know, haven't paid rent in six months or twelve months or. And so I just I want both sides to be shared. What would that look like? Because it sounds like you're saying just let people stay. But that's not necessarily fair either. So if you could answer those two for me. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, so um, the if you go to one more slide, we just have the list of the, the so these are the congregations that are currently participating in rotating shelter for Ann Arbor um, and Celine, uh, um, but uh, have reached out to a lot of other congregations to um, be part of it. In terms of the funding, um, at the end of the slides, we'll show you that we, our plan is to have a draft in like a report that goes out and that we would engage with other municipalities at that time to ask for additional funding um, and identify additional funding. Um, so uh, I think that's kind of like the first answer to your question. And then in terms of eviction prevention, so we estimate um, right now from kind of like the Hawks data that um, uh, it's around $3,000 on average that it takes to prevent an eviction. And so we estimated that um, it would be great to have 150 households that we could prevent eviction. Um, so estimated around 3,000, that would be 450,000 um, in total costs. I will say we did just, we sent this presentation in and then I did just see that the Ipsy Township dollars are, are coming through um, that are going through Barrier Busters. So a portion of that will um, hopefully get to be used for eviction prevention, um, but not all of it. Um, but typically, you know, um, the idea is around being able to maintain that housing going forward and being able to pay for it going forward. Some of those, um, criteria were relaxed during the CIRA program, the COVID emergency rental assistance program, um, just to you know try to pay for as much to get people in a stable spot, but um, likely moving forward that we would go back to the criteria around, you know, that they, they can show that they have income um, or money coming in that they could sustain their rent once the back rent is paid off. Commissioner Somerville had her head down so I can ask one more question. <laughs> um, so when you talk about eviction prevention, what, if any education, do any of your agencies do to help people understand like the processes? I've, I think I've said this before. I've, used to, I've served landlord tenant papers for a couple of decades. And what I find is that the tenants don't even know what are the processes. And I actually talked to a, um, a landlord and asked them or suggested that maybe they change their practice. Maybe they add on uh, five or 10 minutes at the beginning of the signing of the lease to do a quick checklist with the tenants about if you don't pay, then you get a seven day notice of quit. Then you they move forward if you haven't paid it by then. So I'm interested in knowing along with this eviction prevention, what type of education do we try and provide so that people are better informed? Um, yeah. Yes. So the Housing Alliance just did a training for individuals that we posted online that's available for folks. And it was from legal services that walked through the eviction process. So people know kind of how the process works. You know, the seven day notice isn't the notice that you're getting out of the unit immediately. Um, and so that is, you know, one way to provide um, uh, education. The other is that um, agencies that are doing in-home supports um, at lease signing are typically talking about what the responsibilities are of the lease and walking them, walking tenants through the lease. Um, the folks that are being served through eviction prevention are not necessarily so folks that are receiving ongoing services. So that's um, an area, you know, where we have identified that other you know, resources are needed. So the city of Ann Arbor just launched a program to provide 
um, services for folks that are um, to be able to save their housing choice vouchers if they're going through an eviction process and help people through that process. Um, it's certainly, you know, the um, tenant's responsibility to pay and also report when they have a change of income um, for if they're on a voucher. And oftentimes that is confusing for folks or they don't know or they get back, you know, behind and stuff. Um, and so there are some programs to be able to help folks in that situation that have housing choice vouchers. Um, since that's such an important resource that folks, you know, um, uh, we don't want them to lose as well. Thanks, Commissioner Sanders. I guess one thing that I would just like to throw out, and we can talk, I know we're going to have more time to speak about this during a regular meeting. Often what happens is someone gets hit with, uh, we're increasing your rent by $300 a month. And so the person can pay the $900, but this additional $300 is out of their budget. Um, and personally, I would like to see a way for us to help navigate that instance because we, we learned a few weeks ago how many affordable units are no longer online in Washtenaw County. And the only way to get more is to build them and subsidize them with government dollars. Uh, but that's gonna take quite a while, even with all the projects in the pipeline. So I think you know that's like relevant to eviction diversion is also dealing with the issue of people getting surprise hikes in their rent cost. The average last year to this year was an increase of $122 per month on average in Washington County. Yeah, and, and offsetting $300 a month is cheaper than when that person becomes homeless. Okay. Yeah, and uh, as mentioned a moment ago, we, this is our current list of congregational partners for the rotating shelter. And then Commissioner uh, Sanders, the, um, at, just to be more specific about the congregations we've spoken to that are not on this list, it's about 20 or so more that we've spoken with. Uh, everyone's very supportive, obviously. It's just some congregations, uh, we do ask a lot in the rotating shelter. We actually ask them to volunteer overnight. So some just due to, maybe they don't have many parishioners or they don't have a good space, they're not able to do it. Uh, some of these are partnerships where it only mentions one or two, but uh, sometimes it mentions two, but where you'll have one, a congregation that can lend their space, but doesn't have the parishioners. Um, we help kind of backfill those volunteer areas, but we're still reaching out. Uh, I've got, uh, we're working with ICPJ and a couple other groups around how do we get these additional weeks filled because um, we still do have a gap and it's really important to fill that gap because if we see this increase that we expect, which is a need to shelter 200 individuals on a given night at our highest point, if we don't have congregational partners for February, we will have we won't have enough capacity. So I'm confident we'll get it filled. You know, and there's a lot of back end work going on there. But uh, I guess another ask is if anybody's listening to this and any congregations want to talk please reach out to me as well. So, so th this is great. And I, and um, kudos to all of the faith-based organizations that step up to the plate. I really was asking you, and I was going to let you sidestep it. What municipalities have you asked for money and resources from that have not delivered? <laughs> if you don't want to answer, okay, I can talk to you off mic. But I want that. I want people to understand that the ask is not just to us. It ends up being in our basket, but the residents belong to all of us and it needs to be made clear to them who is willing to help and who isn't. Thank you. Um, I forgot, I don't, Commissioner Labar, did you wanna say something right at this point in the presentation or do you wanna wait until later? Yeah. Oh, I see. Your first stop. Thank you so much. We just have a few more slides and then um, can open it up. Um, next slide, please. So we um, have worked to consolidate kind of like what the needs are, but we are not in, yet in a position to make those kind of like recommendations on kind of dollar amounts per se and um, the asks, but that's coming in the next week or two. Um, but we're trying to, you know, be um, creative about um, the the needs. So, but these are the things that have been identified. So, individual Dan just shared with you. You know, individual overnight shelter in Ypsilanti Friday through Sunday um, is still not identified. Working diligently to to identify a site. Um, individual rotating shelters, those sites that we just talked about, and then family rotating shelter sites um, that can accommodate between 25 and 30 families for January through March. We figured um, that would be probably the time in which we would see an increase if we um, see an additional increase in families. So January through March is the target since this would be a totally new um, program for Washtenaw County providers. 
Next. And then in terms of staffing needs, so we did identify additional staffing um, uh, or um, additional funding needs to expand staffing at daytime winter shelter, both the congregations and the one that's operated out of the Delanus Center. Um, overnight and um, driving volunteers. This is, um, uh, we just feel like an opportunity to share with the public <laughs> more broadly. So that's why um, these are included, just so you know, um, volunteers to be with those accessing daytime winter shelter, um, volunteers that can conduct activities, staffing for overnight winter shelter sites. And then we do know um, and was uh, shared with us that the county has the five case managers um, that have been used to support families in hotels. And if um, that program ends, it um, could be that we could use those in the family rotating shelter if we can find that site. So lots of kind of balls in the air, but that was um, what we're looking at in terms of staffing. And then the next one is around um, food, transportation, and laundry and shower needs. So our um, task force talked a lot about those. Um, certainly we have some um, needs uh, that we've identified. So daytime sheltering meals are typically provided by volunteers and congregations, um, funding to support the provision of meals um, offered at Food Gathers. Food Gathers provides uh, meals for folks at the community kitchen at the Delana Center. Typically folks will go there um, and then go to the rotating shelters, be transported to the rotating shelter site or other sites. Um, but if there are meals that needed to be provided off site, there's no funding to do that right now. Um, and then the use of passenger vans to support transportation of guests. The shelter has one van, I think that's right, um, that they got a couple of years ago, but um, we have we have those needs, um, donations of bus tokens and bus passes, and then um, Fed Up Ministries is offered to use their mobile shower and laundry truck when available and when needed, um, but we are still trying to identify if there's other laundering or bathing needs that we might find. So then just two slides out, I think. Yeah, one more. So um, we're continuing to meet and refine the plans and recommendations. Um, the interim report will be finalized and distributed to across the county, lots of municipalities, lots of congregations everywhere, um, and uh, we'll be um, kind of being having more specific funding and in-kind requests once the recommendations in the report um, are finalized. But I wanted to provide that for now. that the last slide? Yes. Sorry. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. So we have folks lined up um, to speak. I'll just start because I'll give everybody else the rest of the time. Um, thank you for doing all of this work. I know that I uh, have been somewhat a part of the task force, but as many of the people on that list, we're all stretched. Um, so I appreciate the, the weight of this issue that you all are carrying. Um, Commissioner Labar, I'll start with you. Thanks, Chair. Um, man, Dan, thank you for the uh, overview. Uh, I, I, as the COC designate from the board, get to see some of this in a little bit more real time, but it's good to see it uh, in aggregate and good to see it at this time of year, obviously. A few quick questions. Um, I mean, I was looking up while you were presenting uh, the NZB report that we commissioned back in 2015 for housing. Is that still essentially the last housing stock report that we're basing some of these assumptions on? So um, that report has the affordable housing stock, but we do have the Corporation for Supportive Housing published a report for us that is um, for beds and units that are needed within the homeless system of care. So that's a more updated report. Um, the the short of it is that we need more of everything <laughs> from shelter to permanent supportive housing and everything in between. Um, but that is probably the more recent report. When, when is that from? So the uh, the report is this year, but the data is from a few years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it, it may, Chair and colleagues, be something that we want to take action on sooner rather than later in terms of commissioning a new NZB style report uh, that we did in I think commissioned it in 2014 and got produced in, in 2015. Um, you mentioned a 48 hour uh, number on Hawk. That, I get nervous about good news or positive momentum. So that seems like a better answer than what we'd had, not a sufficient answer, but better. Um, 
what are we missing there though? I feel like, do we have the, the budget on hand to continue to staff that, to continue to make sure it, it, it works to the level needed? Where's a, where's a blind spot and how does that tie in with some of the dearth you talked about around eviction prevention? Because I, I feel like that's good news, which again, kind of makes me wonder. The, um, so the 48 hours is a community standard that was set back in 2011 when Hawk was created that um, from the time of uh, getting a call to the time of assessment. Um, so being in 48 hours, we are like so thrilled that we're back there because we were not there um, a number of you know months ago. Um, and so I would say, yes, it's good. Ideally, it would be an immediate handoff from the call center to the assessment. Um, and it, that's just a staffing budget you know, um, issue that we don't have enough folks that are able to take those calls in, in real time, but that would be the ideal. So it's not a question of sophistication of the system, but rather just volume in terms of staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything yeah, on the individual it's, side. Uh, interesting to bring that up because we have talked about in the, uh, we have a task force that meets every week around our new Hawk system. Uh, and Morgan was a big part of that uh, from OCED. Uh, and, um, the, we, had, we did talk about wanting to have a conversation about what an aspirational budget would be to get to real time, because it is a capacity issue. At the shelter, we do the individual assess, assessments and we're at about 48 hours as well. And the issue is, is you, Hawk getting all these calls and then you, they're on the phone and somebody is on the streets and they want that assessment right then. And that our staff are already meeting with somebody else at that time. So they can't leave that meeting to go. So we, if we had more staff, more staffing, we could- and mobile. And, and mobile staffing at various areas, because we've talked about ideally we would have staffing like even in the hospitals or in the jails when people are being discharged so that we could do those assessments. So when people leave those those uh, settings, they're able to have somewhere to go and have their have their needs better met. So Chair, I'll wrap it up and just say, um, I remember asking Morgan several months back when she presented on this, do, you know, do you have the, the structural support you need? Um, and, and she gave me a good diplomatic answer. Uh, if you have an aspirational ask, I would say this, the, the, the time to aspire in that and the time to, to name it is probably now, if for no other reason, then we're working on the budget. Uh, it, it hasn't gone through the internal uh, traps and process, but uh, it is a question that's always relevant to the nine of us as a policy body and to be responsive to the needs in the community. Knowing what would be a, a really good answer might help us get a, a decent answer or a moderately improved answer. So the, the sooner we can get something on that, I would welcome uh, wherever that may come from. So um, th thank you. This is great work and report and thank you for what you do. And um, the kind folks at First United Methodist Church downtown Ann Arbor uh, are always looking to help. Uh, and I, I know somebody there, my mom. So let me let me know. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner Labar. Commissioner Hodge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the presentation and for putting it together really quickly to fit with uh, the housing presentation that we're going to have during the uh, Board of Commissioners meeting. I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at the slides because those were published. If you did, I'd just be curious on if there's any of those um, strategies outlined there that you think are particularly worthwhile for us to invest in. I see smiles. There's a couple. On the top of my head. Um, but I would say the, like the, um, you know, sustaining Hawk was I think one of the first ones and yes, like we, we do need that. Um, I think there was a discussion around kind of what um, Commissioner Somerville talked about in terms of being able to pay for rents for folks and would certainly um, say that we absolutely need more um, assistance in that way. I think one thing that was missing was eviction prevention resources, um, just knowing that we don't have as many resources and um, what we were using typically was state dollars that are called emergency solutions dollars. We were using some of those for prevention. They're now all being used for Hawk. So um, we are in a, having a gap there. Do you have any other? Yeah, I think one thing to add there is, um, I just got a chance to review it yesterday. Uh, and I, I'm remembering the one slide where I talked about a, a, a summit yeah. of some kind, and also an assessment, looking at our total system and how do we get better. And I, cause I think one thing I had talked about when I got a chance to review it was just that I think there's this opportunity, and I mean, for me, only being here a, couple, a few years and working in other communities, 
one thing I've always loved about our community is that we have this really strong public private partnership. Like there's really a lot of caring people who have a lot of energy that want to put towards this really important critical issue and uh, stakeholders and donors across the community and people who really care about this. And how do we like bring everyone together? I, I, I'm going to sound a little bit Pollyanna, but I think there's an opportunity around that because the need's not going away. And I think people are more and more aware of the issue. I mean, people who weren't even thinking about it are like, wow, rent's really high right now. So I think we can kind of bring together um, the advocacy partners, the providers, uh, community members, and government uh, all as a whole as part of like those that assessment and that summit process. It's more than just one event. I think it's a process. Um, but I think that I'd be really interested in that because I think it's something that when I came to this community, it was my favorite part about this community is that we already had a little bit of that. Let's get more of that. So, so it's along the same lines. Uh, you might not have an answer for this off the top of your head, but within the what you presented to us and then having seen what you saw in the presentation that we're going to get later in that discussion, uh, what parts of that would you want the Board of Commissioners or the county to fund versus other uh, entities in the community like local governments is uh, Commissioner Sanders brought up or other community partners. Really what I'm thinking about and what I'm hoping comes out of the conversation that we have later is for us to be really clear on what we're taking responsibility for. Uh, and I'm hopeful too that the board will decide we wanna do that with Hawk and take responsibility for Hawk and make sure that we make Hawk County employees and it's a stable system and then we could have people do the assessments and immediately put them onto a caseload. Uh, but so what, what would you like to be the county's responsibility? for this winter shelter or for what you're well, broad, more broadly yeah. but the winter sheltering piece too like for winter sheltering what part of this do you want us to do versus yeah. what do you want yeah i mean do? i think we um we want it to be a community-wide effort and not just a county thing like we would love to see ann arbor has been invested from you know a long time ipsy has started to be invested but it would be wonderful to have we homelessness doesn't have geographic borders <laughs> like you would think a township and a city and whatever and we would love to have more um, municipalities, especially in terms of the eviction prevention and putting money into barrier busters um, and other you know, eviction prevention resources for folks. And then I would also say that along the same lines, um, shelter diversion um, you know, funding, um, that is also something that could be um, spread across many municipalities and everybody contributes a little we were just estimating we could divert you know 30 families with a thousand dollars each and that would be thirty thousand dollars in the grand scheme of things if you had it across multiple municipalities that each contributed three thousand bucks and we had 10 communities we could get it done so um that that's kind of you know like we would love to see more investment across the county um, and the county can certainly take the lead on some of this. And I'll say one more thing related to that is that, um, you know, we have so many restrictions on the federal dollars that come in, the HUD dollars, the, you know, HUD pass-through dollars from MISHTA, and we can sometimes not prevent something from happening until it's way too far down the stream. And with flexible local dollars, you can actually prevent um, something at much um, more uh, cost-effective way um, you know, when somebody is $50 behind on their rent or they can't pay the late fee and, you know, $100, then when it becomes this like snowball effect of now we're, now we're looking at $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, and you have to be within 14 days of the eviction to get the resource. So um, I think what we can do is like make sure to use our federal and state dollars as effectively as possible. But if we had more local dollars spread across municipalities like the barrier busters fund right and and be able to have that flexibility then we could be a little bit more upstream and really help folks before they land into homelessness okay one specific thing on winter sheltering what would you like for us to do one pick, just pick one <laughs> i mean eviction prevention is what okay I, eviction prevention one, i like yeah. it okay we heard it here thank you Thank you. Dan wants um, <laughs> also, Insight. just to add on, eviction prevention is more cost effective. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we're really, are you sticking around for the presentation? I think we're moving it up to the beginning of our meeting. So great. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody feel good about moving on. You're All right. Anybody want to entertain a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. All right. All right.